Father, we pray that you would examine our hearts and lives today, that, Father, that you would show us what you would want to show us in our lives. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. You know, there are times in our lives in which we need to simply stop and reevaluate where we are, where we're heading, where we're going. Sometimes that we need to reevaluate our marriage and ask this question Am I the type of spouse that I should be? Am I helping our marriage to stay vibrant and healthy? Am I doing the things that I need to to make our marriage what it needs to be for the Lord? I need to ask myself that. And I need to reevaluate our marriage from time to time to put a, a spotlight upon myself and ask, am I doing the things that I need to be doing to grow a healthy marriage? And there are times that we need to stop and say, hey, am I the son or the daughter that I should be? Many of you know this past week uh, I had a funeral service for my father. Unexpectedly that he got sick on um, Saturday morning early and, and I was called to check on him, went to the hospital. And in those hours there at the hospital, you begin to think, have I been the son that I should be to my father? Have I honored him with a life that I should? He lived here in Paris for 13 months. In those 13 months, was I all that I should have been to him? You see, we need to reevaluate our lives, and time to time, we're called on to do that. But I want you to understand today is that day that you are called upon to reevaluate your ministry. If you're saved, you have a ministry. And the Apostle Paul is asking you to reevaluate your ministry. Are you influencing people for good? Are you influencing people for the cause of Christ in your life? See, we're asking you to do a diagnosis upon yourself. Not a self-diagnosis, but we're asking you to allow the Holy Spirit to look into your life today and diagnose where you are. And so reevaluate your ministry today. Take your Bibles. And we're going to look in the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, beginning with verses 1 through 3. As we look at the subject, evaluating your ministry. In Ephesians chapter 4, beginning with verse 1, notice what the Apostle Paul said to the church at Ephesus. He said, therefore, I the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy. Notice those words. A manner worthy of the calling which you have been called. With all humility, gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Do you see what Paul was doing in these three verses? He was calling upon the church to reevaluate their ministry. And so today, we have been called on by God's Word to reevaluate our ministry. And it all begins with this the circumstances which caused a reevaluating a ministry. Paul writes, to the church at Ephesus while he was in a prison in Rome. By now, Paul has been in prison for five years. Listen to what it said. By now, as Paul is writing this letter, he's been in prison for five years, two years in Caesarea, and the rest of the remaining years he's been in Rome. Do you get the point? Do you understand what Paul is saying? Has it soak into you what Paul was saying? Paul said, listen, I've been in prison now for five years. I've had time to reevaluate my own ministry. I've had time to examine my life before the Lord to, to see where it's going and, and what it's been and where it's heading. I, I've had that time. Paul said twice in this book, I am a prisoner of the Lord. 
He's emphasizing the fact to him again and again, I am a prisoner of the Lord. I, I, I have been confined. I have been shut out. I have been chained. I have been moved from prison to prison. And I've had the time to seek and to reevaluate my ministry. He's not asking you to do anything today that he has not done himself. Paul is not asking you to take a step that he hasn't done. And what Paul is emphasizing here is, listen, I've gone over my ministry time and time again in these five years. And I'm asking you for this one hour on this Sunday morning for you to reevaluate your ministry. And he reminds them for the second time here in verse 1, I am a prisoner of the Lord. Listen to me. I am following the Lord. And so I'm not asking you to do something that I haven't done, Paul is saying. You know, it's hard to get people to go where you've never been. It's hard to get people to climb to a level that you have never climbed to. And Paul is not asking them to do something that he has not done. Paul says, listen, my desire for you is this, that you watch my own life and see that I have examined my own life and my own ministry. I, Paul is saying, have evaluated time and time again my ministry in the Lord. But the second thing Paul emphasizes here is the challenge to reevaluate your ministry. We find that Paul gives us a challenge. Not only did Paul say, listen, I've been locked away for five years. Yes, I've had time to look at my ministry. But Paul now says, because I have looked at my ministry, I'm calling upon you now to look at your ministry and that you would evaluate your ministry. Notice what Paul says, I implore you to walk worthy. Notice how Paul is calling upon you now to reevaluate your ministry. The word implore, some of you might have the word beg. Some of you might have the word beseech, urge, exhort, implore. It's a Greek word that you're very familiar with. It's a Greek word, parakaleo. It's the word that we use for the Holy Spirit, but it is also a word that means to come alongside of someone. And Paul says, listen, I'm not just writing you from this prison and from a long distance away. He said, literally what I'm doing, I'm coming alongside of you as a friend. I'm putting my arm around you. I am begging you to do this. I am so from my heart asking you to take this time that you would reevaluate your ministry, that you would walk worthy. The word walk there needs to be emphasized that it's simply talking about your conduct. Paul says that your conduct needs to be in line with the calling that, that Christ has given you. That your conduct should match Christ's conduct. And he says that you would walk your conduct worthy of your calling. I want you to notice the word worthy. It's the Greek word oxios. It literally means the balancing of scales, the balancing of scales. So what Paul is saying, that you would walk, your conduct would be worthy, that it would balance the scales. Here's what he's saying, that your private life would match your public life and it would balance out, that you are genuine. You're not one thing in your private life and you are another thing in your public life. No, he said, man, you're the same. You're the same wherever you are, wherever you are. He says, look, you balance out. He says, you know what? Your talk matches your walk. That you don't just have a great talk and, man, you can really lay it out there. No, it matches how you live your life. And Paul was saying, look, walk like a balanced scale. Be balanced. Be genuine. Be sincere in how you walk. And then notice what he says he says, this calling, the calling that you have been given. Peter speaks of that calling in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, and he says it this way, who has called you out of darkness into this marvelous light. 
And the Apostle Paul is emphasizing that you have a call upon your life. It is that call that came to you when, that when you were lost and separated from him. It's a call that came to you maybe on a friend day, a revival like we're getting ready to have. It's a calling that awakened you that you were lost and what you needed was Calvary at the cross. That was your calling that he's called you with. He's calling us today. If you were to come to my house and hang out with me, you'd find out there's two things that I have. I have a landline and I have a cell phone. But here's what I find on my landline if I were to go through my messages in a day or in a week. Here's what it sounds like. If it says, would you vote for this candidate? It says, are you, and they give some name that I never heard of. And then they say, will you call back, please? Or it's a warning they give about something that is happening. There's nothing personal, nothing that really uh, appeals to my life, and I wonder why do I have that landline that I, I'm paying for when it's usually nobody calls on it. But there is a call that the Paul to Paul that is emphasizing here. It's the greatest call of all. It's a call that God has given you, that has brought you out of darkness and has brought you into his marvelous light. It's a call that has called you from when you were not in fellowship with God that has brought you to be in fellowship with God. It is a call that when you were walking independently, now you're walking dependently upon God. It is a call that when you were lost that brought you and found you. It is a calling that Christ has called out to you, your heart and called you to be a part of his family. It's the most magnificent call that any person alive could ever hear in their life. It is that call that comes to a person's life. Have you had that call? Have you been called out by Christ? I want you to notice what that call has done for your life. Listen to these words. You are now God's possession because of that call. Because God has called you, you're God's child you are chosen, you are beloved, you're an heir with Christ, you're his temple. The Bible says that you are his ambassador, you are his witness, you are his workmanship. You have been made alive in Christ in Ephesians 2, 5. You have been raised with Christ in Ephesians 2, 6. You have been seated with Christ in Ephesians 2, 6. With all this as the background Paul says then, you are to walk worthy. Because of all this that has happened to you, you are to walk worthy of that high calling of Christ in your life. Look what he's done in you. Look what he's doing for you. Look what he's prepared in the future because of that calling. And as a result of that calling, he said, look, you're to walk worthy. You're to live a balanced scale before him. If you were to be placed on that scale right now, would it be deficient? Would there be something missing on that scale? Would it tilt quickly to the side? Because there's something that is deficient in that scale in your life? because you know in your heart that you're not walking according to how you should be. That is why the Apostle Paul says that we must reevaluate our lives. So how's your ministry? How's your ministry today in the Lord Jesus Christ? How are you doing? There's the third thing that Paul points out that we need to be aware of. It's the criteria to reevaluate your ministry. You see, in these verses already, what we have seen is that Paul reevaluated his life, and Paul gives a calling to you, and he says that you are to reevaluate your life. But then Paul does such a beautiful thing. Paul gives us a measuring line. He gives us five characteristics that should be alive in our life, that should be active in our lives, that we should be able to point to them. 
And you know how maybe on a door you measured your child when they grew up, and each year you would measure them, and you would write the date. And maybe you have all those lines somewhere, maybe in the kitchen, out in the garage somewhere. What we're asked for you to do today, Paul was saying, get against the line. And get against the line and see how you measure up to these five characteristics that should be in every believer's life to measure your ministry. And so today, at the end of the day, you have measured, you'll be able to measure yourself and see how you have done. And so we reevaluate ourselves. And the first one characteristic that he gives notice is humility. It's interesting that John Wesley noted that neither the Romans nor the Greeks had a word for humility. Isn't that interesting? In the biblical time, they knew nothing of humility. That wasn't a trait. That wasn't a characteristic they wanted in their lives. What they wanted was pride and arrogance and self-sufficiency. But we find that when Christ comes in your life, he wants you to have a spirit of humility. Because we understand what the opposite of humility is, that it's pride. And it was the very thing that caused Lucifer to exalt himself to the position that he wanted to be above God. It was his own pride. He exalted himself. He, he was full of pride. But don't you understand that it was pride that, <coughs> that brought down, really, the first man and the first woman? It was pride because they thought they could be self-sufficient, independent of God in their own will. It was their own pride that did that. It was pride that drove Nebuchadnezzar to face the judgment of God where he went mad, where he became like an animal crawling around on all fours, the most powerful man in the world because his pride is now acting and becoming like an animal. Naaman, because of pride, almost missed a miracle. They asked him to be dipped in the Jordan seven times, and he thought to himself, man, that nasty-looking old Jordan River that runs dark and ugly, and that I'm supposed to dip down in that old ugly Jordan. He almost missed a miracle. But it's something like pride that you and I have to deal with in our own lives, don't we? that we want to exalt ourselves and we, we want ourselves to be, in a sense, vindicated. And we deal with it all the time, pride in our lives. And what we do, we counteract pride with a humble spirit. A humble spirit is one that acknowledges that I am nothing without Christ. That all that I've achieved and all that I want to achieve, all that has come into my life, is because of what Christ has done. And if I'm going to boast, the only thing that I can boast in is the cross of Jesus Christ. And he says to us that we are to take our place next to the marker of humility. And so as we move to that marker of humility and we, we stand against it, How's your ministry? How's it going? And then he gives us another characteristic. He says gentleness. Gentleness. The word literally means strength brought under control. Sometimes when we hear gentleness, we think of a spineless person. Somebody that's milk toast. Somebody that doesn't have any courage or strength in their lives. They're they're kind of like a Barney Fife in a sense. They, they just don't know what they're doing. They're nervous all the time. They don't have any strength or forbearance in their lives. But we find that's not what he's talking about here. Literally, the word is talking about a horse in all of its strength and all of its power, yielding itself to the master's reins. That's an example of gentleness. We find about Moses. Moses was called the most humble man on the face of the earth, a gentle man. It was said of Christ in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 23. And while he was being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he did not utter no threats, but he kept entrusting 
himself to the what who judges rightly. When you evaluate your ministry, is there a spirit of gentleness there? That you yield your strength, your might to the Lord. You yield your temper, your anger, your rights, your thoughts. You say, Lord, you take them. You're in control of these. And Lord, I yield to you. Notice the third one. Patience. You can translate that word patience means long-suffering. It means that you are patient with God first. That you are finding yourself hanging on to the truths of God. And you just keep hanging on to it, believing it and saying, God, man, I stand on it. I believe it's going to happen. And that's what happened with Abraham, wasn't it? In Romans 4.20, it says, yet without respect to the promise of God, it says he did not waver. Man, he just kept hanging on in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God. And being fully assured what God has promised, he was able also to perform. Let me ask you, are you patient with God? Man, are you able to hang on with God? Are you able to say, God, man, I know that you're working in my life. I know that you have my best interests in mind. God, I believe I'm patient with you. I'll never forget a a, a friend of mine and that I became good friends as I pastored him. And I noticed there was a spell that I didn't see him at church and I called him. And I said, man, where where you at? I haven't seen you lately. What's going on? And he said these words. He said, tell me why I should be faithful to God when God hadn't been faithful to me. And I said, what do you mean? What do you mean God hadn't been faithful to you? What are you talking about? He said this and that, and this happened in my life. Here was a man that didn't have patience with God. Unless God jumped and moved right when he wanted him to, man, I'm through. Are you that way in your ministry? Are you that way in your life that unless God meets every demand, everything that you say, in a sense, you're kind of through with him. You kind of write him off for a time. But this long suffering is also referring to how you look at people. Meaning that you stay with them. That you're patient towards them. You're not so easily to write them off Once they make a bobble, you just cross their name out and they're done. And so let's move back and let's look at the marker now of patience. Where are you? How's your ministry? But there's another one we need to see. It's bearing, notice in your scripture, it's bearing one another in love. Notice the emphasis, love. The Bible says that love covers a multitude of sins. It doesn't turn a blind eye to somebody's sin, but what it's saying is is that, that you're able to overlook the frailties, the peculiarities of other people, and we're all pretty weird, aren't we? It's able to to overlook those things and say, you know what? I love you. We're moving into some of my most favorite times of the year. I love the holiday season. I love spending time with my family. I love being with them. But if you came to one of our family events, you might say, boy, the Turner family, where'd they come from? And don't say Oklahoma, okay? Please don't say that, okay? But you know what? I don't mean this smart aleck, but listen to me. I really don't care what you think about my family. Listen, because I love them. They're my family. I love them. Oh, they've got some strange things, and they would say the same thing about me. But I'm telling you, they're my family. And that's what he's saying is that how we are to look at other people, that, that we are to have that love for them like they're, they're your own family. 
Don't be so quick to judge and to be critical to them. I wrote down some words that I thought might help drive it home. Are you keeping score? I knew a lady in the church. She would save papers, cut it out of something that would happen in the church. Somebody outside the church got in trouble, she would cut it out and save it. She would save when people got married to see if they had a child. Is that why they had to get married if they were expecting? She saved all that stuff. She was one that kept score. She wanted, in a sense, to keep it straight that look how bad they are, look what they have done. And she kept score on the people in the church and the community. Do you have a critical spirit? You kind of soured when you got older. You hang on to everything that somebody says or does. I mean, you take it personally. I mean, man, I don't know about them anymore. Love can overlook those things. Love says, please, somebody overlook my life and my frailties and, and my faults in my own life. And so Paul says, this is your ministry. This is your line. This is how you evaluate your ministry. Let me ask you, Paul is saying, are you bearing with one another in love? And then Paul comes back and he gives one. Notice quickly, he says that we are to be in unity that we are to be in unity. And quickly, I thought of, when you walk into the church, when you walk into an event, when you walk into your office, when you walk into your family, do you bring unity together? Do you bring about unity? Notice he says, unity of the Spirit. He's talking about that the Holy Spirit is the one that, that brings unity. And you are able to bring unity in the situation when you are yielded to the Holy Spirit. And then notice in the bond of peace, when there's unity, there's going to be this bond of peace. Are you one that unifies the body of Christ? Are you the one that unifies your Sunday school class? Are you the one that brings unity to the church? Or are you one that brings division and strife? And by the way, that's not a spiritual gift, okay? Amen? That's not a spiritual gift. Paul says, what should be the mark of your ministry in the church? Look, look at the mark. You should be about bringing unity. From time to time, we've got to do it. From time to time, there's got to be a reevaluation. Sometimes we've got to take our car in. And they got to do all the diagnostic tests to the car. You might not like it. And I can assure you, you're probably not going to like the bill. But you got to do it. And sometimes you've got to go to the doctor and put on that robe that they didn't make them right. It doesn't cover you up well. But you got to do it. you got to get an uh, uh, evaluation of your life where you're at. And whether we like it or not, the Apostle Paul is saying, you know what? We've got to reevaluate our ministry. We've got to look at it again and with fresh eyes through the lens of the Holy Spirit. Today, you've got to ask yourself, and I'm, am I walking worthy of that calling? the greatest calling that it's ever been to man? Are you walking worthy of that calling? And are the characteristics in your life, maybe not perfect, but they're there. They're showing themselves. Do you have a humble spirit? Are you gentle? Are you patient? Are you forbearance in love? Are you a source of unity and a source of peace? How do we need to draw this together? 
I think it needs to be drawn together with something like this. Is that we say to the Lord, Lord, show me clearly my ministry. In regards of what you have shown me in your word today, and would you give me an accurate diagnosis of my ministry? Would you be so bold today to do what we've been called on to do is to say, reevaluate, Lord. Reevaluate my ministry. I'm just going to ask you if you would to bow your heads and close your eyes. And would you ask the Lord to show you clearly your ministry? What are you finding? Are you deficient in some areas? Is the scale a little tilted? Have you pushed aside in a sense that calling of Christ, the most magnificent call that has ever come to a man or a woman or a student, that calling to come and follow me? But it's more than that. It's what he has placed in your life in that call. You're a child. You've been seated with him. You've been raised with him. You've been made alive in him. Are you walking worthy of that call? Father, I pray that you would turn your spotlight upon our hearts and lives and that we would see clearly what you would want us to see today as we measure our ministry according to your criteria. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. As we stand...